Okay, guys, good. Welcome, everyone. Good to see you all. Everyone's doing well. So, uh, you know, today, you know, we have the weekly Torah portion we read. So the weekly Torah portion this week is about the offerings, about the sacrifice. It's called Carbonos. So I feel I'd, I'm going to have to explain this because this needs a lot of explanation. So I want to talk about the idea of the temple. I, I want to explain because Noahides are allowed to bring offerings too when we had a temple. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the two types of offerings that they bring. And what, and what that would mean and why maybe there's different opinions about it. But let's start from the beginning. Because we know that one of the central commandments of being a Noahide is a not to believe in idolatry, believe in one God, right? Not to, not to do idolatry. Now, what is idolatry? This we need to explain because um, most people will think that well, that, those were stupid people. They are bowing down at the idols. How dumb. We're, we're all so cultured and so advanced that we don't have these ideas. But we need to understand them because the danger is very prevalent in this world still. Let's understand. How did idolatry start? You know how idolatry started? I don't know if you had talked about it, Raj, if you guys ever spoke about it. But the way idolatry started was like this. Because it's strange. If you look at at the history, idolatry starts three generations into society. That's crazy. That means you have Adam, Shays, and then Enosh already. By the generation of Enosh, Shays' son, Seth's son, there it says that they started committing idolatry. That's what the verse says. How did that happen? It's very soon. No, it shouldn't have happened yet. So the origin of idolatry was not the stupid people you see today. It was a very good rationalization, but very messed up too. As all lies, every lie has to have a little bit of truth. So the early idolaters said like this. They said, listen, God created everything in the world. That We know that. And all of these things are like... They're God's servants, so to speak. So if you had a case where you had a king and he sent the messenger to do something, I don't know, whatever, to come to your town and to, to, to say the king's decrees or whatever it is, so you would honor the king's messenger. So we should also honor the messengers of God. So if the sun is giving us light, then God is giving us the sun to give us light, so we should thank the sun also. That was the original flaw of the idolaters, which is not a crazy idea because, okay, you know, if you understand it, like, uh, you know, when we say the grace after meals uh, in, in Jewish law, we, we, we're thanking God after a blessing. We even say, and God should bless the table we ate on. Meaning that the table didn't do anything, but things in the world that give a benefit to us, you should be thankful for. Um, you know, I I, um, I think I, yeah, I told last week the story about uh, 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 of uh, Victor Miller who put his head in the water. I think I told that story here last week. Uh, Victor Miller used to always. I told that story, didn't I, Rod? I, that's what I told. I, I'll repeat it because I didn't tell the story. I, I, I don't know if it was a different class I told. Yeah, them. you didn't tell the story. I, I would have remembered that one for sure because oh. I know it. Yeah. Okay, I thought I did, but there's a story about Victor Miller, who was a great rabbi. And one day, he, um, he, he, his, he was an older man, and his son walked into the house, his grandson, and he saw the great sage, or Victor Miller, with his head submerged in the water, of the sink, sink water filled the water up with sink with water and his head was submerged in, in the sink. And so the grandson's waiting there, like, what, 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 what's going on? So then finally, after he's waiting for a little bit, waiting, 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 the grandfather's head's in the water, grandfather pulls his head in the water. And the grandson says, Gram Grandpa, <laughs> the great sage of Israel explained this to me. Why, why was your head submerged into water in the sink? So he said, I'll tell you why. Because today I walked out of the house. 
And I heard somebody saying, oh, the air is so smoggy. I can't even breathe. It's terrible. And I thought to myself, what do you mean? You're complaining about the air? The air is, the air is no good? What would life be with life without, without air for a minute? It would be like, would it be like for, without air for two minutes? So I put my head in the water to appreciate the air. When I came out, any air was beautiful. Yes, you mentioned this last week. I did mention last week. I thought I did. <laughs> okay. So it's a great story because it's one of these stories that's not just about like the idea, it's it's the concept. So Victor Miller used to even he used to give like he used to have a whole discussion about the buttons. He'd appreciate buttons and clothes and realize the things that we have in life that we should be thankful for and acknowledge that. So the early idolaters, they said, well, the sun is God's messenger. He's giving us light. Let's thank the sun. And but what happened was soon they forgot the source and they just thanked the sun. Not as, you know, saying, oh, I'm so glad God gave me clothes and God gave me air. But thank you, air. Thank you, clothes. And making them a separate entity to themselves. That's the origin of idolatry. Okay. Now, um, this is very, very real. Um, you have, let's say, like, you know, in Christianity, there's, there's these discussions about the devil fighting with God. Uh, that's idolatrous. God doesn't have, there's no other power that can be competing against God in any way, shape, or form. And, and this is where idolatry, you have to understand, it wasn't just dumb people. It was very, very smart people. Such smart people that knew how to hook into spiritual powers in the world and manipulate them. That was also part of idolatry. So, for example, let's say God creates a spiritual force that makes something happen in the world. What they call in Hebrew a malach. In English, they call it an angel. I don't like those names because it has all the connotations that we have that are really off. The word malach is the word action, malacha, an action. And these are the spiritual rules that God makes to create the world or, or, to, or to run the world. But they have no power of their own. It's like when you look at the law of gravity. Let's say I drop something and it falls down. And you say, wow, who did that? It was the God of gravity. That's idolatry. What is gravity? Gravity is the rule that God made that it should fall down. And there are spiritual forces that also have laws and rules. And once you disconnect them from the source in any way, you are now giving power to something else in the world. And that is idolatry, a bordering on idolatry. There's a lot of details here. I, I imagine that in some of the courses you've done goes through what exactly you can do, can't do. But, but for the enlightened people that you, you all strive to be and all are in potential of what you want to understand is you want to realize there's no other power than Hashem. And anything else, all the forces, those are the things that God creates to run his world. And they're really, in a certain sense, they conceal God in a certain way because you don't see when I drop something, I don't see that God is saying, oh, this is going to drop right now. I see you create a law and the thing functions according to that law. And, and, and foolish people can give it its own, its own entity, its own power. And that's already either idolatry or bordering on idolatry. Now, also to realize the idea of the holy temple or a temple in Jerusalem, in a certain sense, should give us a question. But God, God is everywhere. You can't limit God. I mean, God is a house. What does that mean? So we don't understand. From God's perspective, there's nothing that can separate God's complete existence everywhere. However, God chose to create a place in the world where his presence can be clearly felt. Okay, and that really was the job of humanity. In other words, as people became worse and worse in the beginning of time, God's presence was less and less felt. 
came along Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the generations that brought God's presence down and can be experienced in the world. And that's what happened when we got the Torah and God's presence was felt in the tabernacle. And eventually when we went to the land of Israel was now in a set place called the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. Again, doesn't mean God's presence is not everywhere. It just means there's a place where you can feel it. It's going to be palpable. It will affect us. So much so that people, when they walked into the temple, they came out with divine inspiration. That's where you'd get your divine inspiration. Now, the temple that Solomon built, that Shlomo built, was for all people, as he says there, he says, God should answer when anyone, anyone, Jewish, not Jewish, turn their hearts towards the place where God's presence is felt in the temple, and they pray God should answer their prayers. So much so that the Talmud says that if the nations of the world understood what the temple was doing for them, not only would they have not destroyed the temple, they would have had guards guarding it 24-7. I don't know if you guys realize it's an amazing thing. When King Solomon built the temple, there were no natural catastrophes in the entire world the whole time. There was no famine. You know, so, you know, you can blame it on global warming. It's this, it's that. Okay, everyone has everything to blame it on other than maybe the way we're acting or any other things. That, that's not obviously a possibility in the minds of modern man. No, 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 it's only, it's only something else. So it's nothing, nothing to do with what, anything we do, how we act. No. But that's the foolishness of, of people. And of course, the reason why they, ha they, they have a leg to stand on is because there, there are foolish you know, people who say, oh, I know why this happened because you did this, you did that. Unless you're a prophet, you don't know why a particular thing happened. There are many, many reasons. However, when the temple stood, the whole world had gained from this incredible phenomenon, the reality that God wanted that his presence should be manifest in the world. Now, we had two temples. First temple parallels Abraham. Second one parallels Isaac. The third one's going to parallel Jacob, and that's going to be the last of the temple. Two temples were both destroyed. The third temple when it will be built, will never be destroyed. That will last forever. That will move the world into the different levels of, of what this world will go to and what it'll, it'll be. Now, when that happens, a person's going to want to bring offerings, like in the, in the, which I said to you before. A Noahide has to be careful for the, you know, not to attribute any power to anything else. And when the temple is built, the Noahide who wants to send offerings to the temple, it will be accepted. It will be brought up in Jerusalem. Great, amazing. But now i got to explain what is this idea of an offering. In English, what do we call it? We call it sacrifices. Now, wow, that's a very dangerous terminology. What, what am I sacrificing exactly? What, am I sac what does that mean, sacrifice? I'm giving up of something I I need, and now I don't don't really want to do it. My sacrifice means like I kind of don't want to do it, but I got to do it, which is counter the most basic rule of a sacrifice. It means it has to come from your deepest will. That's what a sacrifice means. It has to come from your. So when we say in English the word sacrifice, it almost is, it has a mistaken connotation from the very beginning. This is something I don't want to do, but I got to do. That's, the, that's not accepted sacrifice. It's got to be that this is what you want to do. So sacrifice may be a very bad translation. As a matter of fact, it is. It's the wrong translation. The word korban is the word karev, to get close, to bring me close. That's what it's about. A korban brings me close. It's to bring me in a connection to God. So maybe offering is a better word in English. In Hebrew, the word is korban, is, is, is a vehicle of, of closeness. That's what it is. Now let's explain this a second, because there, here again has the same potential problem. It, it, what am I giving? See, when I give something to a friend, it's because 
they lack something for giving you because you like getting it because you like the gift I gave you. It, it, it's something that you want. So obviously, we're talking about Hashem. If you misunderstand what an offering you're doing is, we're going to have almost an idolatrous understanding. Because if you think God needs our offerings, then we said he has needs. That's already idolatry. That's wrong. The same thing, which you have to understand, and this is, this is really where a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of religions make a, make a very, very grave mistake. They make this grave mistake in the following. We say that, let's say, Hashem loves us. He created the world. He wants to give to us. Okay, that's true. So now, the next step people say is, oh, so I relate to God, and therefore he loves me, I love him, and, and therefore he's like me. He's like a, he's a person, God forbid, because he has things I can understand. When somebody, lo- let's, say, let's say, for example, someone feels compassion, right? You, you, you're walking down the street, and you see a person, and he's got, you know, broke, he's got missing a leg, and he's got a broken arm, and, and, and he's filled with boils all over his body, and he puts out his hand and says, give me some money, please. What happens? You have tremendous compassion, because you, you, you feel bad. So, stirs up in you this compassion, where, where I, 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 I have to give him, if I don't give him something, you know what? I feel bad, right? So now you say, oh, wait a minute, God has compassion. God's compassion is not the same compassion we just talked about. The compassion that I have when I see this person means that it affected me, and I now need to give to them. And although I'm giving to them, but it affected me, and now I'm also in need of helping them. So we got to get that out of our heads. And this is where, where a lot of people make a great mistake. Yes, Hashem is loving, compassionate, all ways of perfection possible. However, we don't understand the way God acts. He, we know that's the way he chose to relate to us. He chose to relate to us in a com- way of compassion, a way of love. That's what we understand. That's the way he set the world up. But don't think we understand God, that now he's, and this is the problem, I mean, the craziest thing, people wearing their gods as like, as symbols, like, like something that they can understand. Idolatry means that there is a place where the person needs to understand, quantify, limit, this is what it is. I got, I got, I got God in my back pocket. God forbid. You have nothing there. You have a person. You have, an, you have, you have nothing. That's not God. We don't understand why God, we can't understand God in any way, shape, or form. We can understand only the way he chooses to interact with us. But he needs nothing. So what am I giving him when I bring an offering? He doesn't need anything. So what am I giving? What I'm really giving is I'm saying I want to be connected. I want to come close. If I realize that the source of everything is God, and I want to connect, then that is what he's allowing us to do by giving of ourselves. Let me explain this a moment. A very deep idea. People ask a question. Who, you know, there's there's different phrases. One, One phrase is, Birds of a feather flock together. And another phrase says, opposites attract. But which one's right? Which one's right? I mean, they're completely a contradiction. Which one is true? Which one's right? So, I have to understand like this. When I'm, if I'm like, it's a hot day, and I've been running, and I'm really hot. I want to drink what? A hot cup of tea? No. I want cold drink. If I'm cold, I want a hot drink. Why? Because I'm looking for a completion. There's a completion that a person has. 
Okay, if I'm hot, I need the cold to complete. When, let's say a couple get together, so on one hand, the male, female, it's better when they have similarities because they understand the world they're each coming from. But the idea of a couple is to become one. And becoming one means that they are completing each other. So the male, female, which are two opposite components, they fulfill each other. So yes, on one hand, you're talking to somebody, a friend, who's not completing you. But what happens is, is that they are like you, so you get along with them. Birds of feather flock together. But when you're looking for completion, you need to have the part that's fulfilling you. So when a couple gets together, the male and female coming together, that means now like a hot drink day, getting a cold drink, now you become together, you become one. That is the deeper meaning of when a person becomes unified with their soul. Okay, very, very important idea to understand this. In a certain sense, a little different, but in a certain sense, the idea of an offering is realizing my source is God and I want to connect back to my source. It's, it's, it's becoming whole. God doesn't need it. doesn't need anything. It's not for him. It's for me. It's for me for the place where I say I want to come. So maybe it is a sacrifice. Maybe it's an expensive thing you're taking and, and you're giving up. Let's say, for example, let, let's say, for example, in life, you have something that, you know, is, is enticing to you. It's going to be a lot of money, but it's the wrong thing to do. Did you make a sacrifice by not doing it? Right. Imagine you have like you could you could make a lot of money, but it would cause you you'd have to cheat or do something that would really be against what you know to be right. So is it proper to call that a sacrifice? Well, in one way, yes, and in one way, no. In one way, it's yes, because you've sacrificed what you could have had that would have been inappropriate, all that money you could have made. But on the other hand, it's not really a sacrifice because the thing you would have lost if you would have cheated would have been much greater. I, I, I choose, I prefer to be this person who is this righteous person because that's the real me. And if I do the other thing, I'm actually giving up the greater thing of value, who I am. So the word sacrifice in English is like a weird kind of word. Yes, you're, you're, whatever you're bringing, the offering you're bringing is costing you money and you're going to but what you're trying to do is you're saying, I am connecting to my source and that's where I really belong. That's what God lets us do. Let's bring offerings. Offering is a statement that I'm really offering myself. You see, we have items in the world. We have things that we own. And the things we own are God given to us that allow us to use them in a way to make the world better. In other words, it's not an accident you have your car. You know, there, was, there was a rabbi in Israel, he used to call the car the mitzvah mobile, the mobile to go and do mitzvahs. And he used to tell people, listen, in Israel, I, I mean, like when I, I used to live in Israel, and when I lived in Israel, even today, not everyone has cars. In America, you don't have a car. Like what do you mean of a car? What do you, how do you function? In Israel, a lot of people don't have cars. So, so what would happen? You have a car. You bought your car. You know, I was like, great. I mean, when I first bought my first car in Israel, you know, I, I lived in Israel five years. I don't have a car. I bought a car. Now, all of a sudden, you're driving around and you start seeing people. This guy needs a ride. This guy needs to go here. I can help you. All of a sudden, I have this, this item that I can change the world with, which is connected to me. It's mine. It's not mine to it's mine. I can do what I want with it. It's mine that now is an extension of me. And I could use it like I use myself to do things that are good. So bringing an offering is really bringing me. I want to connect. I want to come close. 
I realize that that's my source. That's what I'm doing. Now, Noah to said could bring two kinds of offerings. This is very fascinating because many opinions, I think, say that Noah bring what's called an Ola. An Ola is an offering that goes completely to God. There is an opinion that says that Noahides could bring shlamim to. Shlamim are offerings that were brought partially to the to, brought up, partially were eaten by the Kohanim, and partially were eaten by the people. And that's a much harder thing to do. It's much easier for us to go and to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be completely giving to God. It's much harder for us to go into like, you know, eat something and, and sort of think we're doing something religious and spiritual at the time. It's much harder. It's much, much harder. That's a very, very, you know, I think that's why there's a discussion. Can, can, can that be done? But Jews have to do that. Jews have to basically make sure that their physical actions are also, even their pleasure they're taking is done in a way that that moment, it's a spiritual act. So I, since there are two opinions here, I think that it, it behooves you to kind of think about, can, can I do that? One part is to feel I want to give myself. And one part is to say, can I, in all of my actions, when I do, when I have, enjoy what I'm doing, can I do that in such a way that it's bringing me closer to God? Right? Sometimes when you do all the things for our own pleasure, we kind of lose perspective of God. I'm doing this, this is me. and. The second level of the of the offering that's a shlamim is to be able to even to do that to like when I'm eating the food now, this food is from God. Wow, this quality is from God. This pleasure is from God, and 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 having that connection there, that's why it's fascinating. There's two different opinions, and I'm, I'm sharing them both with you because hopefully when the third temple is built, you know, soon, especially as you see uh, uh, situations in life unfolding. Where, where all the uh, things are playing out that may happen a lot sooner than, uh, than people think. So uh, you want to bring your offerings then. So you'll certainly bring the uh, offerings of the olos, the ones that go completely up to the heavens, but you also hopefully will be able to bring the ones that, uh, that will bring shlumming, that are, are whole in every way, even the ways that we can use them. That's the idea of, of, of having a, a, a understanding that God doesn't need anything, that's idolatrous. Other powers, that's wrong. That's how the thing started. There's one source of everything. And there's one source of us. And the ability to bring an offering is the recognition that that is our source. And we want to get close to our source. And hopefully when the third temple is built, we'll all be able to bring offerings quickly in our time. Okay. Open up to questions, ideas.